We're in chapter 2 of our study of the last Old Testament book of Malachi. We're going to look at verses 10 through 16. So Malachi 2 verses 10 through 16 will be our text for this evening. Uh, typically weddings are happy occasions, aren't they? The church buildings all decorated with flowers and candles and friends and family come from all over. Uh, couples stand up and make their vows before God to be faithful to one another till death do them part. But marriages do not always end in happily ever after. That's just the reality of it. In a fallen world like ours, sometimes unions that were entered into with the highest of hopes break down, and for one or both of the parties, I do becomes I don't. And in some cases, one of the spouses is evidently at fault for the breakup. In others, the causes are much more complex. But in almost every case, when a marriage fails, the end result is a lot of pain, guilt, shame, and sorrow. Now, in our modern context, almost every family has been touched in some way by divorce, one way or the other. And that makes the subject difficult and painful to talk about. And it might seem easier just to skip over those passages in the Bible that talk about it. In fact, if I were a verse-by-verse -verse kind of preacher, I wouldn't deal with this tonight. <laughs> I would just kind of, well, you know, they're talking about marriage and divorce, and we don't have anybody that really needs to hear that tonight. And so I'll deal with something different. But that's what we do here. We go verse by verse, and when we come to a difficult sub subject, we deal with it, whether I like it or not, and I don't particularly like this topic. But uh, God, our, our loving Father, speaks on this area, in this area of marriage and divorce, and we need to talk about it tonight, and so we will. Now, in Malachi's context, God raises two specific areas related to marriage in this passage. Men were choosing to marry women from outside the Israelite community, we see in verse 11. And they were also choosing to divorce their Israelite wives in verse 14. Uh, those two sins were not unrelated. The men were divorcing wives from within the community of faith to whom they had been married to as young people in order to marry someone outside the faith community. And such decisions were not necessarily simply the result of relationship conflicts or personal attraction. After the return from Babylonian captivity, Judah was a small, disadvantaged region of the Persian Empire, surrounded by much more powerful neighbors. And in such a situation, marriage connections were a very useful means of gaining political and economic advantage. And whatever the motivation, though, the result was that those with pow that without power to defend themselves, uh, the women in those relationships, they were being tossed aside on the trash heap and oppressed in a way that was offensive to God. Uh, this is a way of looking at things that not only confronts the people's sin, but also points to them to the deeper hope that the gospel provides to sinners such as us, as we'll see at the end of the sermon. So Malachi begins tonight by pointing to the Lord's role as Israel's father. He poses the rhetorical question in verse 10. Have we not all one father? Hath not one God created us? And clearly those questions are intended to bring to mind the answer, yes. Yes, he is the father of all of us, and he has created us all. God was not simply Israel's father in the generic sense in which God is the father of all whom he created. When the Lord brought Israel out of the land of Egypt, he became their father and they his firstborn son in a very new and special way as we see in Exodus chapter 4 and verse 22. As Israel's father, he entered into a covenant with the present generation's ancestors in, on Mount Sinai, 
the Sinaitic covenant he entered into there. And that covenantal relationship with God shaped the people's obligation to one another as fellow servants of the great king. And so we read again in verse 10, Have we not all one father? Hath not God created us? All right. Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother then? By profaning the covenant of our fathers. As a result, uh, their sins against one another were never simply a private and personal matter, but they were at the same time sins against God. You sin against one of my covenantal children, you're sinning against me. They were also offenses that profaned the recently rebuilt temple there in Jerusalem, the symbol of the Lord's presence in their midst. Judah, verse 11 says, Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved, and hath married the daughter of a strange God. So if the Lord is the father of all Israel, then that makes him the father of the bride in all of Israel's wedding ceremonies, so that subsequent rejection of these brides represents a rejection of him. Now Malachi also reminded the people of God's goal in creating marriage in the first place. Verse 15, and this is difficult to understand. You'll see just the reading of it, it's hard to understand. Here's how the verse 15 reads. And did he make, or did he not make one? Yet had he the residue of the spirit, and wherefore one? That he might seek a godly seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. Now, to me, the essence of this verse is that in marriage, God makes them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union. And what's the goal of all of that? Godly offspring. That's how I see this verse. There's a clear reference here back to Genesis 2.24, where God created Eve to be Adam's helper and presented her to him so that the two could do what? Become one flesh in accordance with God's design. But this verse reminds us that in that union, Adam and Eve were not to become simply one flesh, but they were also to become one spirit. In the beginning, marriage was intended to be a deep-seated, enduring union of a man and a woman, body and spirit, that would provide the context in which Adam and Eve could obey God's command to fill the earth and subdue it, as Genesis 1.28 says. Marriage was God's means of producing and nurturing godly seed, godly offspring, children who would in turn worship and serve the God who had created them. So marriage was not just about producing the next generation, however. A person's spouse was also intended to be one's companion, as Malachi puts it in verse 14. Yet ye say, wherefore? Because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant? Now here he uses a very unusual Hebrew word that describes a scene or a joint in a building or in the process of binding and cementing two things together what Genesis 2.24 calls cleaving. A man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. So, in the beginning, marriage was designed by God to be a unique, permanent bond of companionship between one man and one woman. It was to cement two different individuals into a single, indivisible unit, thus providing a stable foundation for a thriving godly family. That's how God intended marriage to be and does to this day. This godly design for marriage had broken down though here in Malachi. To begin with, some of the men were marrying women, as I said earlier, from outside the Israelite community, outside of the covenant community. And such marriages could potentially be bodily unions 
but they could never establish the kind of spiritual unions that God intended, nor could they provide for a solid foundation for the raising of godly children. And God knew it, and so it upset him. Verse 11, again we read, Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem, for Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord which he loved, and hath married the daughter of a strange God. So these women were daughters of a strange God. That is, their worship was offered to a God other than Israel's Jehovah God, Yahweh. They were worshiping other gods and not the real God. And these men who married uh, uh, these women outside of the faith, they rationalized their relationship by pretending that their, their wives' allegiance to other gods really didn't affect their own worship. After all, as verse 12 says, they were still bringing in their regular offerings to the Lord. Verse 12 says, the Lord will cut off the man that doeth this, the master and the scholar, out of the tabernacle of Jacob, and him that offereth an offering unto the Lord of hosts. So they're still coming, they're still worshiping the Lord, and they, they don't get it while the Lord's upset with them when their wives don't. They, they, in fact, they were frustrated with God's seemingly unwillingness to accept their offerings, according to verse 13. And this have ye done, again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping, and with crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offerings of any more, or receiveth it with good will at your hand. Why aren't you receiving this offering, Lord? It doesn't matter that my wife is worshiping Baal or some other god. I'm still worshiping you. I'm still giving you the offerings that you require. Why don't you accept this? And they didn't see why it mattered that their spouse's faith, provided that they were still personally able to maintain, uh, uh, provided they were personally able to maintain their own faith. It doesn't matter. Why should God care so, about such matters of personal choice? Of course, as Old Testament believers, these men carried on their own bodies the proof that God was concerned about the most intimate details of their lives in the form of circumcision. This should have reminded them that Israel's God laid claim to every aspect of their existence, even their most personal and most private. Yeah, he is concerned about your marriages and if you marry people outside the faith of Israel. Now this issue is still very relevant today in our own situation. The temptation for someone who's looking for a spouse and not finally one within the boundaries of the Christian community, is to spread the net a little wider. I can't find somebody to marry in the church, or even in other churches around. I just can't find someone suitable. So some single Christians look around their church and conclude that there's no one suitable marriage material. And in such a situation, what's a man or a woman to do who wants to get married? Meanwhile, there's a, a really attractive person at work who seems to be a little interested. Now, that person isn't hostile to Christianity and seems okay with your going to church every Sunday. So why shouldn't you date such a person and kind of see what happens? Malachi's response to that is right up front. To marry someone outside the Christian community is faithlessness to God, profaning the covenant. Again, I refer you back to verse 10. And if we have no possible intention of marrying the person, then we have no business dating him or her. It may be helpful to unpack the rationale for that prohibition a little further, though. To begin with, if we marry someone who doesn't share our faith, we are definitely shortcoming the marriage. Marriage is intended to be much more than simply having someone to come home to at night and sit down and look at the stars or watch a movie on Netflix. Marriage is intended to be a spiritual union in which we share the deepest desires and aspirations of our hearts with our spouse. It's supposed to be a situation in which we share our spiritual struggles and pray with and for one another. 
It involves sharpening one another, rebuking one another when necessary, edifying one another spiritually, encouraging one another in Christ. It's designed to be a deep and lasting friendship in which the couple serve the Lord together, building each other up in their mutual faith. A Christian cannot possibly uh, connect on the deepest level in which the, uh, 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 of the soul with someone who doesn't share their life in Christ. It just can't be done. There will be a huge area of existence that's permanently shut off from that person. In addition, to marry someone who doesn't share our faith shortchanges our children. You see in the context here, God's concerned about the children here. Parenting is designed to be a team project, not an individual sport. Uh, children will model themselves after both parents, for better or for worse. They therefore need a father and a mother that are both actively involved in training and shaping the way that they should go. Both parents should involve themselves in the child's world on a daily basis, guiding them with biblical correction, infusing in their lives a profound understanding of grace. Parenting is very challenging even when both parents are actively involved. How hard it must be to raise godly children then if a parent is alone in this undertaking, while the spouse is at best neutral to the Christian faith or at worst against it. How are you going to raise children like that? Now, of course, by his grace, God can and does work in many situations in which one parent is a believer, and sometimes when neither parent is a believer, right? God will save one of his elect out of those kind of families. Many believers have no choice but to work alone for their children's spiritual good, and God's faithful work in producing godly children is far more important than even the best efforts that two Christian parents can do. Because we all still, as Christian parents, make mistakes. But why would anyone deliberately put their children in such a disadvantageous situation where both parents are not believing and, uh, the same thing and trying to direct the child in the same pathway? Most importantly, though, if we marry someone who doesn't share our Christianity, we're shortchanging our own faith. We all have to compromise our wish list of qualities when we, that we want in a spouse when we settle on a particular person to marry because there is no perfect spouse. When you're dating, when you're courting, even when you're courting another Christian, that other Christian isn't perfect. And neither, neither are you. It's just not perfect people. And so we kind of say, well, okay, they're not good in that area, but they're good in this area, and, and so on and so forth. And we make compromises when we choose our spouses. Maybe he has too much hair on his back, and you just can't stand that. Or he's, he's shorter or less muscular than we imagined that our husband would be. Or maybe she can't cook. Or she has no interest in your favorite sports team. And so for some people, such things like that might be deal breakers. I can't stand people with hairy backs. I don't want to marry a wife that's not interested in the Buckeyes or the Orlando Magic. I love those teams. Uh, but for most of us, we, we pick out the spouse's good qualities and the good qualities outweigh any small bad qualities, we say, okay, I can live with that. I can live with her as my wife. I can live with him as my husband. If someone always had a dog or a cat and can imagine life without such pets, and then they find out the person they're dating is allergic to pets, that may be enough to eliminate them as a potential spouse. I've got to have my animals. I'm not going to live life without my puppy. And he's allergic, so I can't marry him. Meanwhile, someone else who, who never wanted any pets would have no trouble living with that person who has allergies. It doesn't matter if they're allergic to dogs and cats. I can't stand animals. But if that person, every fall Saturday, is spent cheering on his favorite football team, 
discovers that the only person who hates the sports and, and, and just can't endure watching another football game on TV, that might cause someone really to slow things down. I really like this stuff and she doesn't. I don't know if I want to marry her or not. So it all depends on how important those particular characteristics are to our vision of our life together with our spouse. Now, where does potential spouse's faith fit in on this wish list that we're talking about? It's a potential deal, is it a potential deal breaker? Or is it simply a minor fault? Something that it might be nice to have, but it's not absolutely necessary. Surely, that answer to that question depends on where faith fits in on your list of priorities. If one's relationship with Christ is at the very center of your life, your only hope in life and death, as the Heidelberg Confession of Faith says, then surely it has to be the main concern in evaluating a potential spouse. If your faith is not central to such a major decision regarding whom you're going to marry, then someone might reasonably question whether one's faith is as important as they say it is. In Malachi's situation, the men were protesting that they're still fulfilling all their proper religious duties, even though they've married foreign women. They're still attending the temple on a regular basis. They're still offering the appropriate sacrifices, according to verse 13. But as we saw earlier in the book of Malachi, if you recall, it wasn't enough for them simply to offer the right sacrifices. God wanted them to offer their sacrifices with a right heart, hearts that were fully devoted to him, and if they couldn't worship him that way, he wanted to shut the whole thing down. In other words, it's not enough to have faith that exists just on the outskirts of life, even though we still might attend church on Sundays and do all the right religious stuff. A saving relationship with God is much deeper and much more demanding than that, touching every area of our lives. For a couple to thrive in marriage, God needs to be at the very center of their lives and the primary focus of all their attention. And both spouses are daily trying to live closer to God as they, and God, having God as their mutual center of life, they will be drawn together naturally as they do. If God's the center of my life and God's the center of your life, then we're going to be drawn together as a couple because he's the center of both of our lives. On the other hand, if the two spouses have different centers of their lives, then either they will be drawn closer to another, pulling themselves away, or they're going to pull away, pull away from God as a couple, as the center of their lives. Or as they each draw closer to their own centers, they're going to be drawn away from each other. There was a married couple who professed to be Christians who said that God was at the center of their lives, and the husband got interested in Jeeps, and he bought one. And he started hanging out with other Jeep owners, and he joined the Jeep club. And after a while, he and his wife started hanging out with other Jeep people, and they voted him president of the Jeep club. And they attended all the club meetings. All club meetings seem to happen on Sundays, don't they? And so he went to the Jeep meetings on Sunday as a husband and wife. He became, as I said, president of the Jeep club, and he was so involved that his church attendance dropped off to become almost non-existent. And he drew his wife spiritually downhill right alongside him. Now, had she not been interested in Jeeps like he was, then they probably would have divorced. All he does is spend time with his Jeep friends, going Jeeping and being president of the Jeep club, and I hate Jeeps. And she'd go another way. That's just an example of how things work if one or both spouses do not have Christ as the main focus of their lives. Now, ironically, our list of personal priorities and relationships might also lead us to overlook prime marriage material right under our noses at church. See, if we major on secondary features such as body shape or 
personal interests or hobbies over faith when we're evaluating potential spouses, we may eliminate someone who would be an excellent spouse in helping us in our pursuit of true spiritual goals. If we want a deep spiritual union with God and a family raising children who love God and want to serve Him, then these secondary goals don't seem to be so important. A guy might think, well, I, I, I like blondes, and I, I got to marry a blonde. And if she's not blonde, I'm not going to date anybody who's not a blonde, because I like blondes. And yet there in his church is this beautifully godly brunette who would make an excellent wife, who loves the Lord, who has all her doctrines in a row, and yet I'm not marrying her, she's not a blonde. How stupid is that? But people do that kind of thing because they don't have the right priority. Achieving spiritual goals has nothing to do with a person's physical appearance or the fact that they share the same hobbies. It's not that physical attraction doesn't matter at all, let's be honest, it does, along with other, person, uh, other important things like personality. But when we put these secondary qualities and we make them primary, we're missing out on what's truly important in a potential marriage partner. Now, men in Malachi's day weren't only dating uh, uh, and marrying the wrong people, they were compounding their sin by divorcing their original wives in order to do so. And now we're shifting topics from marriage to divorce. Now, Old Testament law did not institute divorce. There were no laws in the Old Testament that said, if your wife did this, you can or must divorce her. On the other hand, the Old Testament did not entirely prohibit divorce, except in a very few specific circumstances. For example, in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 13 to 19, a man who fabricated a false charge of immorality against his wife is forbidden from ever divorcing her. You did that to her, you cannot divorce her. Now obviously, if divorce was never permitted, then there would never have been any sense in making that regulation. Divorce obviously was allowed. On the contrary, the Old Testament recognizes that in a fallen world, divorce sometimes happens. But in a culture where men held all the power and an abandoned woman had very few options, it regulated the practice in specific ways in order to try to protect the women from its ugly consequences. You see, in the Old Testament, a divorced woman couldn't separate from their husbands, find an apartment, try to start a new life. If they left, at best, they would have to leave their children behind and maybe go live with their parents. At worst, they would find themselves on the street with no one to protect them and nobody to care about them. It wasn't good being an Old Testament woman back then. And that's exactly what was happening during Malachi's day. Men were divorcing their wives for no good reason other than, hey, if I marry this foreign wife, uh, I can get some more money. I can raise my social status. I can maybe get involved in politics. And so I'm ditching this one in order to advance myself which led the Lord to say that he, uh, that he hateth putting away. I hate divorce, he's saying. For one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit that ye deal not treacherously, verse 16 says. So by divorce, they were actually condemning their wives to a dismal life as a second-class citizen. They violated their vows to love and protect them and therefore proved faithless to God, the God that they had made their vows to. And compounding all this, their goal was their own financial and social gain as they went to marry pagan women who were better connected in the business world or the political world. And that decision made perfect sense to their own logic but was exactly the opposite of God's purpose for marriage. 
In the beginning, as we said earlier, marriage was intended by God to be an exclusive relationship for better or for worse until death do us part. That's what marriage was meant to be. And these guys are saying, I don't care about that. I want to up myself. I'm going to go to a better level than I am now, and she's holding me back. I don't care about her. I want to do my own thing. It's, it's the tragic tearing in pieces something that God intended to remain whole. Marriage is intended by God to be forever, and we should always, always, always fight for that goal. Now, that's not always easy, and if our marriage gets in trouble, we really need to cry out for help. We need to find some pastors or biblical counselors that can help in identifying the hardness of our heart that's causing the, the problems in the relationship. Or our pride, which is oftentimes the case in marriage uh, disputes, our pride will be dealt with, and solutions can often be found that way. On the other hand, biblical teaching on divorce is complex because it recognizes that sometimes hardness of heart can permanently damage a marriage relationship. Some marriages simply cannot be saved. And there may be some circumstances when divorce is really the least bad option. Jesus pointed out in Matthew 19 that adultery is one possible reason for divorce. Now, adultery doesn't always have to end in divorce. There can be forgiveness and reconciliation, but sometimes the damage is so great the marriage just cannot survive. God knows that, and he allows for divorce. This is true especially if the offending party is unrepentant or if the adultery is repeated over and over again. In addition, Paul adds in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 the specific example of divert desertion of a non-Christian spouse as another grounds for potential divorce. If the unbeliever depart, let him depart. But in this fallen world, where there are many hard hearts, there may be other legitimate causes for divorce as well. I will tell you this, if you had a daughter, if you have a daughter, and she is being physically abused by her spouse, and they come to me, I'm not going to say she has to stay married to that guy. I am not going to do that to your daughter. I will not. Because in my estimation, that unbeliever has departed if he's beaten up on your daughter. I'm not going to do it. But it, com it becomes complex, doesn't it? I had someone, uh, some of you will remember the, the whole fiasco we went through with my daughter and her abusive husband. And uh, I had someone come to me and say, my, my mother lived with an alcoholic. And he beat her every day. And she stayed with him through all of that. Now, that's a godly woman. You know what I said? Where's her dad? <laughs> Somebody beating up on my daughter is not going to continue doing that. I'm not going to allow for that. And I'm not going to let her stay in that situation. I disagree with that wholeheartedly. And, of course, they got mad and left the church. That's what godly women do. They stay around and get beat. No, they don't. No, they don't. Physical abuse is a form of desertion, and it can kill a marriage. Even emotional and, and, and verbal abuse or drug and alcohol addiction can make it unsafe for a spouse to remain in the marriage, oftentimes in order to protect the children. And so this is where divorce gets complex. It's not so cut and dry as some people would like to make it. Divorce must never be taken lightly, of course, but in a broken world populated by broken people, sadly, divorce is always going to be with us. God's given us wise pastors and fellow Christians to help us through these complex issues. And because of the grace of God, we know that divorce is not some unpardonable sin. Again, I told you this in the past. I grew up in a church. You could go out and you could murder someone spend time in prison, get your release, and come out and be a popular evangelist. Oh, this is the guy that killed somebody and he went out and he got saved in jail and, and now he's coming to conduct a revival this week. But you can't sing in the choir <laughs> if you're divorced. It was just crazy like that. It's not some unpardonable sin. God is gracious and he can forgive us of all sin 
and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In, in human marriages, there are always failures on both sides. Even when one party is primarily responsible for the breakdown in the marriage, the other partner can always find things that he or she didn't do right. But that's not the case with God. And here we shift gears a little bit. The Lord had always been a perfect husband for Israel. Her unfaithfulness was totally without excuse, but it was so persistent and so pervasive that at one point, even God had to throw up his hands and say, this marriage is dead. That's exactly what happened to the people of God during Malachi's day and exactly what they needed to hear. He could have easily have said to them, you are an entirely faithless people. You have broken your commitment to me and to one another. You have trashed your marriage vows and abused those who uh, placed under your care. Don't bring me your sacrifices. Don't bring your meat offerings anymore or your fake tears of repentance. Here is your certificate of divorce. This marriage is over. Go away. I'm through with this relationship. The truth is, that's what we all deserve to hear from God. If we're honest, we all have been faithless to him time and time again. Like Israel of old, we repeatedly marginalize the Lord until we find our need of him, and then we expect him to ride in instantly and rescue us from all of our problems. We are a faithless people. But even when we are faithless, the Lord is still faithful. We are often covenant breakers, but he is never unfaithful to his promises to us. As the story of Hosea and Gomer shows, so it's a beautiful picture, even as the wrong husband who has plenty of grounds for divorce, God pursues his faithless bride into the desert and buys her back from her destitute situation. He cares for us so much that even after we have provided more than enough reasons for him to send us away, in the end, he will never let us go. Instead, he offers himself for our salvation in a very costly way. That relationship was the goal of Jesus Christ coming to earth. That trip from heaven to a stable in Bethlehem was a central part of God's pursuit of his straying bride. Jesus endured cold. He endured heat, pain, suffering, abuse, ridicule, but he would not let us go. He taught dense disciples. He healed innumerable and sometimes ungrateful sick people. He fed the hungry. He opened the eyes of the blind. Such was his love for his people. And in response, what did they do? They crucified him. We took the holy and undefiled one and nailed him to a cross of wood so that we could be free from our sins. Each and every time that we faithlessly choose our preferences, our desires, and our kingdom over his, we are personally making the same decision that was offered to the crowd in Jerusalem many years ago, joining them and yelling, crucify him. God has every reason to divorce us for our faithlessness. But God is faithful. He's faithful to love us and has joined himself and his honor to us, marrying us to himself forever. The Father invites us, stained and vile as we are, to wed his only Son. And the Son promises that he will never divorce us. In addition, he promises to be at work in us by his Spirit and is so happy when we make the small progresses that we make on a daily basis. This salvation that Christ secured for us on the cross was very costly to the Father. He had to punish his perfect son in our stead at the cost of his blood. He had to turn away from his perfectly only begotten son as he bore our sins, but having paid such a high price to woo us and win us, the Father will now never let us go. When we are faithless, he is still faithful because he cannot deny himself, 2 Timothy 2.13 says. Anyone who comes to Christ by faith is united with him in marriage, 
that God himself has joined together and he's not going to let any man put asunder. It's a, it's a union that no human being or spirit from hell can ever separate. And God will not fail. What he has joined together, no one can separate. Our confidence and hope rest in Christ alone, folks. Since we are such weak and sinful people, the surprise is not that marriages sometimes end in divorce. Rather, it's remarkable that anyone like us who are, are so weak and so unfaithful that we ever stay the course and hang on to one another in a relationship. It's only by the grace of God. But God is so faithful and his grace and mercy so deep that he will never allow our relationship with him to ever end. I want you to leave here tonight being thankful that you're married to Christ and that he will never leave you or forsake you. As Hebrews 13, 5 says, For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace, a grace that causes you to seek us and to keep us. Uh, what a marvelous God you are. We know what we deserve. We talked this morning in 1 John about how we're sinners, how we habitually sin one way or the other, how we're faithless to you on a regular basis. You should just kick us to the curb and move on. But you're not going to do that because you would have to deny yourself. You have sought us and you have saved us and you will keep us and you will never ever leave us or forsake us. And for that we say thank you, Lord, for saving our souls. And now help us to go out into this world now and present this wonderful gospel message. A gospel message of you seeking and saving sinners like us and then keeping us so that no man will ever pluck us out of your hand. You're so good. You're so gracious. And we have tried to worship you today and pay homage to your greatness and lift up the name of Jesus Christ who faithfully saved us at the cost of his own blood on the cross. Thank you, Lord, for saving our souls. Help us to live lives that reflect your honor and glory. It's the least we can do. It is our reasonable service. Help us to do that in the name of Christ. Amen.